And as we begin talking about the church and the church defined over these next uh, today and the next four weeks, we're going to begin to see, have a glimpse of, of really what the Father's love for us is and how it forms our church and forms the church family. And we're going to be looking at five different uh, illustrations of the church over, the, over today and, and over the next four weeks because I believe that the New Testament's um, illustrations and, and picture words that it uses to describe the church really tell us a lot about who we are. And it helps us to define what a church is, who a church is, and what we are supposed to do. You know, the Hall of Fame baseball player and manager Leo DeRoche said, uh, baseball is like church. Many attend, but few understand. <laughs> You know, and that's kind of the reality of, of the world around us. Some people look at us, especially from the outside, and they think, what is going on? Why do people come into a building and they sing songs to a, a person that you can't see, and they're bound together by a book that they read and that they believe in? What, what exactly is going on? What is that group of people? And so as we go through this series, I hope that we will see and learn what we are and that we're reminded that a church is not a building, but a church is a group of people. And uh, today we're going to be looking at a foundational definition for what a church is. And uh, so it's a uh, kind of a technical definition that we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 as we get started looking at that definition. And so I say that today is kind of the technical definition. You could also say today is the day that we get kind of nerdy a little bit. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, sometimes some of those technical aspects of the Bible can uh, seem to just sort of bury me under trying to understand what the Bible is saying. Uh, one thing that I don't want to do uh, whenever I preach is, is get too much into the weeds of what this word means or that word means in the original Hebrew, the original Greek, unless it really matters to what we're talking about. And, and I believe that that's the case today. And so we are going to get a little technical today, talking about Greek and Hebrew a little bit, but hopefully it'll be in a way that we can understand. And so today, our, our question, as we talk about this foundational aspect, the ecclesia, that's the word that we're going to be using, ecclesia, um, the Greek word, as we talk about what this technical definition of the church is, we're going to be answering the question, what makes a church a church? What makes a church a church? Because there, if you ask one person, well, they would say, well, it's bricks and mortar and sheetrock and nails. And you ask another person, well, it's the community. You ask another person, it's, you know, the common beliefs. But as we look through this passage of Scripture, we're going to see some different aspects of the people of God which are necessary to make a church an actual church. And so we'll be talking about uh, local church today and um, as we, as we go through this series, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the universal church, but not a whole lot of time. That universal church, meaning all the Christians from all time periods, uh, all over the world that make up the church, the whole church, the bride of Christ. And so we'll talk about that some in some later messages. But today, we're going to talk about this local church idea. And so if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, uh, let me just kind of give you a little bit of a background. So Acts chapter 2 takes place on the day of Pentecost. And the apostles were in the upper room. They were spending time praying. And all of a sudden, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And in the description, it talks about there being tongues of fire dancing on top of their heads. And wouldn't you like to have been in the room and see what that looks like? Um, I, I wonder if they felt the heat. Uh, you know, some of you guys have a problem. Your hair might have caught on fire, especially if you used too much hairspray this morning. I wouldn't have had that problem. Um, I might have felt the heat a little more than you guys. But anyway, I was just, I wonder what it would have been, would have been like. And then all of a sudden they start speaking in tongues. And, and that means, that doesn't mean that they started just saying different weird, odd things that nobody understood. That means they literally started speaking in other languages, and so when they went outside the walls of that upper room, and they went to the, the courtyards where people from all around the known world, Jewish, Jewish people from all around the known world who spoke so many different languages, they had all gathered together. And as those Galilean men went outside and began speaking the gospel in the Hebrew language, all of a sudden people from Africa understood and people from out east understood, people who were uh, Greek uh, or uh, yeah, Greek speakers and, and hearers understood. People from all over the world heard it in their own language. What a tremendous, tremendous scene that would have been. And so in that scene, Peter stands up and he begins proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. And as he did so, uh, you know that Peter is a good Baptist because he gave an invitation. 
And uh, whenever he gave that invitation, it says that people responded. And so uh, this is the description here at the end of this chapter in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And uh, we'll read through verse 47. And so it says in verse 41, so, they, so those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed to the, proceeds, the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. They broke, bre- broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this description of the early church and this description of the formation of the church here on the day of Pentecost. And so as we read through this and as we study it, Lord, and look at some of the different aspects of this passage, I pray that you will help us to begin to understand what are those foundational core elements that help to make up a church of God. And so as we read this, Lord, may you help us to be inspired learners and listeners and help us to be changed from the inside and let that show up on the outside as we leave this place. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we talk today, we're going to be looking at this word Ecclesia, And we'll see some different aspects of it, which we will get here in just a moment. But that word ecclesia is where we get the word church. And it's first used in, by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, when after the confession of Peter that Jesus was the Christ, Jesus said, that's right, and your name is Peter, which means little rock. And upon this rock, this big rock, not meaning not Peter, but the rock of Peter's confession, the gospel message that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon that truth, Jesus was going to build his church. And so some of you, depending on your background, there, there may, you may have heard this passage talked differently, that Peter was that rock that Jesus was going to build the church on. And I'm so thankful that that's not at all the case because I would rather have a church built on the truth of Jesus Christ than on a man who is imperfect. And so Jesus is that rock. Gospel message is that rock on which he built his church. It's next used in Acts chapter 5 as the people that are formed in the passage that we are talking about today in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 5, they were referred to as the church. And so as we get going, we will talk more about this word. And so we're going to have four aspects of a people of God that are required in order to form a church. The first one thing that we see is that in order to have a church, you first of all have to have a people who are called. You have to have a people who are called. And that, we, we, we see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, those who accepted Peter's message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And so remember a while ago, I said that we know that Peter was a good Baptist, right? Because he gave an invitation. A good Baptist church has to have an invitation, right? These, these are the jokes, guys. This is, that's as good as they get. Um, so y'all just going to have to, y'all going to have to lower your standards and just throw a few chuckles out there if, uh, if we're going to ha- keep this going. And so in, uh, in verse 38 uh, of, uh, of, this, of this sermon, uh, the, people, they, the people say, what must we do? And Peter gives the invitation. He says, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off. Listen, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. And so right there in verse 39, it says, For as many as our God will call. And John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved who? The whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever would believe in him, and have eternal life. And so the, the call is for everyone. The message of the gospel has gone out for everyone. And that we can see that this idea of calling is inherent to the church. We can see it there in the word ecclesia. Ecclesia is a combination word made out of two words, one being ek, which means out or out of, the other kaleo, which means to be called. And so basically the church is the called out ones, the ones who are called out from the world, who are called out to, to hear the gospel message, to respond to the gospel message, and to receive Christ as their Savior. 
And so we see that ecclesia carries this idea of calling, but there's got to be more even than that because the, uh, the scripture tells us very clearly that people hear the call, but they don't always respond to the call. In Romans 10, verse 16 through 18, Paul writes, But not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message. Then he says, So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Yes, they did. Their voice has gone out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. So the message of the gospel has gone out. Jesus' words have gone out, but not everybody who hears responds to the message, unfortunately. We even see that in the scriptures. You have the story of the rich young ruler who Jesus called him and said, hey, come follow me. And the, rich, the, the ruler said, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, look, go and sell all you have and come and follow me. And that's not because that's the, the process for everybody. But that's the process that that man needed to go to because he needed to let go of his dependencies and latch hold of Jesus. He needed to let go of depending on being wealthy and being an influencer and and hold on to Jesus and follow after Jesus. But he walked away sad because he had many possessions. We have the story of Judas. I mean, what other story could you do you need to know that people can hear the message of the gospel yet turn and walk away from Jesus? Judas was with Jesus for three years Yet he did not ever truly surrender himself under Jesus' lordship. And so we have to receive the message, but there has to be more than that. As we go through this sermon today, I'm going to use an illustration to kind of illustrate all four of our our points. And and we're going to think about a graduating class, okay? So think about a college graduating class, class of 2020. We'll show them some love since they, you know, kind of got, (laughs) had a rough year last year. So graduating class, college class of 2020. Their process to becoming that graduating class, to be that group, uh, you know, huddled together and and, uh, trying to graduate together and walk across that stage together, that process began many years before when they were juniors or seniors, maybe even sophomores in high school. And in those time frames, all of a sudden, these little postcards started coming in the mail. If you're a parent or if you, you know, ever uh, remember back to that time period, you know what I'm talking about. All those point postcards from different colleges saying, hey, come be a part of our college. Hey, we can help you become the person you want to be. We've got the degree plan for you. And those colleges send those postcards out to tens of thousands of sophomores, juniors, and seniors in high school trying to recruit them to their team, to their college. And so those high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors, they hear the call. The colleges are reaching out to them. But before they ever get to the point of being that graduating class of 2020, they had some other steps they had to work through. And so just like us believers, we had to hear a call. But then the second thing that we had to do is we had to respond to that call. It's not enough just to hear the gospel, but you also must respond to the gospel. In order to be the church... You have to be a people who have heard the gospel, but also have responded to the gospel. And we see that even in our uh, uh, passage today. But in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, there were two words that were used to describe the people of Israel. There was one word, Ada, which referred to just the whole community of Israel. But whenever the people of Israel were called to assemble together, the writers used a different term. And they used the word kahal. And the word kahal represented a people who had heard the call, but then responded by gathering together. And whenever the New Testament writers were looking for a word to describe the church, they went back to that word kahal and used that word and pulled it into the Greek in order to to describe the church. And we know that because whenever the Old Testament was translated into Greek, The word that they used to translate kahal, a people called out and responsive to God, they used the word ekklesia. And so the church, this word ekklesia has this idea of not just people who have heard the call, but people who have heard it and responded. People who have heard the call and have been called out in response to the Lord. And so these people heard the message and responded. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. So they heard Peter's message, but not just hearing it, they accepted it and obeyed. John illustrates the point that there is a, there is a call and a response. In John chapter 1, verse 10 through 13, he says, talking about Jesus, he says, Jesus was in the world 
and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. He said he came to his own, but his own rejected him. But there were some who received him. And to those who received them, they became a part of the family of God. And so we have to hear the message, but then we have to respond and accept that message. Just like those high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors who get those postcards and they decide, well, I want to go to college A. And so they send in their application and then all of a sudden they get a letter back that says they've been accepted. You know, they get, you know, if you go to a, some, some college and send you a little welcome pack where you can say, you know, I'm, I'm a new Texas Aggie or I'm a new Texas Longhorn or I'm a new Red Raider or something like that. And you get to, you know, celebrate that you've been accepted. But then you have to register for classes. You got to figure out where you're going to live. You got to, you know, there's, there's still some processes to go through before you ever become a part of the graduating class of 2020, right? And so they, they go through the process of becoming a part of that college, but they're still not quite there to that graduation yet. And so we as believers, we, we accept the call. We become a part of the people of God. But, but to become a church, to become a local church, there's still more that has to be done. And so the third thing that we see is that a church is a people who gather together, a people who gather together. So we've, we've got to come together. And this, too, is implied in that word ecclesia. Ecclesia was the word that was used to describe the governing bodies that came together in the Greco-Roman world. So the, the, the Roman assemblies and even the city-state st- uh, city assemblies, they were called the assemblies. And that word assembly, that we say assembly, is that word ecclesia. So it, it, it gives this idea that there's the people, not just who are called, not just who are responsive to the call, but also that are gathering together. B.H. Carroll, who was the founding uh, uh, professor of Southwestern Seminary and also a pastor here in Waco back in the 1800s, he said, if there is no organization and no assembly, how can there be a body? Miscellaneous, scattered, unattached units do not make a body. And what that tells us is that the Christian life was not meant to be lived in isolation. We were not meant to try to become disciples of Christ on our own. We were meant to do that with the body of believers around us. And obviously, those of you in this room, you value that. You value coming together for worship. And you gather coming together to hear God's word. You gather coming together to, to fellowship together, to, to, oh, I would say hug each other, but we can't do that right now, right? And so maybe to, to fist bump or elbow bump or back bump, whatever it is that you do uh, as you come here during COVID season, you value coming together. And I know that there are many who are watching on the live stream who at some point you're going to come back because you value the gathering of the body. And so that's how we, that's how we function. We gather together. And we see that in our passage today in Acts chapter 2, in verse 44, it says, now all the believers were together and held thing, all things in common. In verse 46, it says, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. And so there's this idea that in order to be the church, you have to come together. I know there's some people who say, well, I don't like organized religion or I can, I can, I can be a Christian or I can be a part of the church without gathering together and actually having to come there to the, to the worship center. Well, look, you can't. You just don't get all there is to being a church unless you come together and rub elbows with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Because I need you here with me to worship the best that I can. I need you here with me to be able to fellowship with you. I need you here with with me to learn together in small groups, in our biblical community groups. I need you here as the whole corporate body. Because as Paul and as we're going to look at in, in a few weeks as we talk about the body of Christ, the body is not complete without some feet. The body is not complete without some, some arms and without some elbows. We need, we need some body members in our church that are strong. We need some body members in our church who are, who are wise. We need some body members in our church who, who, who think and who function and who get the job of the church done. We need each and every one of you in this room. And we need those of you that are watching on live stream. We need you in our church body. 
And that is the beauty of the church is that we are, have come together. And I know that as we think through COVID, yes, we do have some things that we're having to deal with. And there's a period of separation that we're kind of still kind of working through. But there's going to come a time, thank the Lord, and, and having trust and faith in the Lord, there's going to come a time where we can uh, toss these masks in the trash. <laughs> Y'all could have amen that one. I mean, seriously. We can toss these masks in the trash and not have to worry about them anymore. You can give me a hug on Sunday morning. I will know what the bottom part of your face looks like, which means I'm going to have to you know, get to know you all over again, I guess. I don't know. But thank the Lord. There's going to come a time where we can all be back in this room together, worshiping the Lord together and being the church together. And as we think about that, that's just a part of the process. For those college students who are coming to college, they're not really a full part of that college experience until they step foot on campus, until they start hanging up the posters in their room and getting to know their roommate, until they go to their classes and and figure out who's going to be in their study group and who they're going to learn together with over the next four or five or six, however long it takes. Those years, they're going to be rubbing elbows together. And so they, they come together. They begin forming that class of 2020. But they still have one more step to go. They have to begin, begin agreeing together on who it is they're going to become. And we as a church have one more step as well. We hear the call. We respond to the call. We gather together. But did you know you can, you can go to a church conference and be gathered with other Christians, and that doesn't make you a church. We can have other people, other Christians come into this room and have a hymn sing or something like that, but that doesn't make that group the church. We must have one more step, and that is that a church is a people in covenant together. A people in covenant together. We as a group of people have to come together. We have to say, this is what we believe based on the word of God. And this is who we believe we are supposed to be as a people of God, as the church gathered together. And we are going to link arms together. We're going to commit ourselves to one another. And we are going to hold each other accountable and allow ourselves to be held accountable as we march forward in fulfilling the commission that God has given us. And so a church is a people who are called and responsive and gathered together and who are in covenant together. And so we see this in our passage of scripture in verse 42. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. There was a group of teachings that they said, this is what we believe and we are devoted to what we believe. And remember, they didn't have uh, Bibles in their home. They didn't have copies of God's word, even the Old Testament. They didn't have that in their home because not everybody could read for one thing. And of course, nobody, most people couldn't afford to have, you know, a copy of the scroll of Isaiah and a copy of the, the Old Testament uh, law and a copy of the Psalms and the Proverbs. They couldn't have all these scrolls in their homes. And so they had to go to synagogue and they would hear the, the rabbis teach on the word of God. Well, for these new believers, they didn't have all the New Testament writings that we have today. So they devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles and they based their lives and their obedience on those teachings. And so they began to, to learn. Next 432 tells us that the entire group of those who believed were of one heart and one mind. Church, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be of one heart and one mind, working together, arm in arm, on a mission for Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope at your calling, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And so we as a church are to be united in a covenant together. It's more than just coming together in a room. It's more than just knowing the gospel or hearing the gospel or even being responsive to the gospel. We must be covenanted together. J.D. Greer, who is a pastor in, in North Carolina and the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, says this. He says, the essence of a New Testament local church is not assembly, but covenant body. If the local church is essentially an assembly, then it only exists when it assembles and only when all the members are present. Assembly is a much needed function, but covenant is the essence. And so even as we leave out of this place, we are still a body of believers in agreement and on mission together. Even the definition of our church that the Baptist faith and message Uh, includes, uh, talks about this. It says, a New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a local body of baptized believers who are associated by covenant in the faith and the fellowship of the gospel. 
And so that's who we are to be as a church. And so it's those biblical doctrines that we hold dear and that we as, we as a Baptist church, we have identified certain core elements of the Bible that we believe are essential to being the people of God that God wants us to be. And so some of those are very obvious. We believe in one God. We believe there is one true God, creator of heaven and earth, that he exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that he is ultimately and eternally perfect. We believe in his word, that this scripture, this Bible that we hold in our hands is the word of God, that it is without error in everything that it includes, and that it is the authority that we have for our life. And we believe that this Bible gets to tell us what we believe that this Bible gets to dictate how we live in the world. And so when it comes to controversial issues such as uh, gender, we, get, we believe that the Bible gets to determine who a man is and who a woman is and what biblical manhood is and what biblical womanhood is. We believe that the Word of God gets to determine what is a marriage, that a marriage is between one biological male and one biological female. We believe that the Bible gets to determine when life starts, that life starts at conception and not a moment later. We believe that the Bible gets to determine everything that we do and the relationships that we walk in. We believe that the Bible gets to determine the, dig determine the dignity of a human life, not the color of their skin, not the religion that they follow, not the lifestyle that they choose to live. And we as a church need to remember that, that it's not somebody's lifestyle that gets to determine whether they have value or whether we show them the love of Christ. It's because they are a human being, that they have blood in their veins, that they have a heartbeat in their heart, that they are created in the image of God himself. That means that whenever God created them, he said, I'm going to put a little shadow of myself in them. And so when we look at them, we look at them with the love of Jesus Christ, the same love that he showed to us, we show to them. We don't have to agree with their lifestyle. We don't have to agree with their religious background. We don't have to believe, uh, agree with their moral choices, but we do have to love them with the love of Christ because Jesus loved them with the love of Christ whenever he went to the cross and he died on the cross for their sins. So just like he died for my sins and just like he died for your sins, he died for the world's sins. And we may not have to agree with them, but we most definitely have to show them the love of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. And how are they going to hear the message of the gospel unless we take the message of the gospel to them in the love of Jesus Christ? And so that's who we are supposed to be. And we base that not on wisdom, but on, or not on our own wisdom, but on the wisdom and the word and the truth of God. And so we as a people are called to be a people covenanted together under a certain group of beliefs. And we actually have a, a church covenant that, that we as a body of believers have. And in fact, we, uh, uh, the, the church, this is the same church covenant that the church has had from the very beginning whenever this church was established. And I've got a couple of my helpers up here today to, to show this. This is Blake and, and this is Jackson. This church covenant document right here was actually hanging up in, in one of our Sunday school classrooms. And um, it's a very common one that a lot of Baptist churches have. But at the beginning of this, it, it establishes the, the guidelines or the surrounding uh, beliefs of the covenant. And listen to the, this as I read it, read it. It says, having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That represents the call that God has sent out to the world. And then it says, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the response. You hear the call? And then there's the response upon our profession of faith. It says, we do now in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly, that shows the gathering together, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. And so there, in one of our foundational documents, we see the call of God, the response of his people, the gathering of his people, and the covenanting together of his people. And the document continues to go on to talk about how we are going to link arms together in evangelism, link arms together in discipleship, how we're going to encourage one another in family devotions and raising up the next generation of Christian leaders. And so this church document, this covenant that we agree on, if you, you may not realize it, but if you're a member, you have agreed to this. This is what guides us and moves us forward as a summary of what we're supposed to do based on the word of God. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. And so 
this covenant that we are in together. We are a people who are called. We are a people who have responded to the gospel in obedience. We are a people who have assembled together. Even those who are on the live feed, who are members of this church, who are included in that. And we are people who are joined together by covenant. And so in that joining together, that means that we have agreed that we want to carry out the mission of the gospel together, that we want to be on mission together, linked arm in arm, marching ahead, not for the sake of the name of First Baptist Church of Round Rock, not for the sake of our own name, but for the sake of Jesus Christ, that name by which men can be saved, the only name by which man can be saved. And we are marching forward together in that mission. And so as we close today, we're going to have a, a time of invitation. And um, I'm, I am going to stand down here at the front. If you would like to come pray with me, I'm open to that. But if you are not comfortable with that and, and, and you, want to pray, you want to pray there at your seat, we're, we want to encourage you to do that too. But I am going to be down here. I'm going to be praying. And, and if you want to pray with me, I invite you to do that. We can stay socially distanced as we do it. But for the rest of us, what I'm going to ask you to do as, as Bo and our, our team come back up here, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to stand as the body of Christ. And you can go ahead and do it now. Go ahead and stand as the body of Christ here at First Baptist Round Rock. And even at your home, if you're watching on, on live feed, I want to encourage you to stand right there in your living room. Stand in unity with us as we say together, we are the church of Jesus Christ right here in Round Rock. And we are going to do whatever it takes to reach the people of Round Rock with the message of the gospel to bring more people into our covenant community here at the church of First Baptist Round Rock. And so right there in your, in your seats as, uh, as Bo and the team play and as they give us a little bit of time to, to pray, I want to encourage you to pray, first of all, that God would soften your heart for the message of the gospel. And if, if you may be in this room this morning and realize that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, and if that's true, then, hey, come down and talk to me at the, at the, during, at, during this invitation. I want to talk to you about how you can receive Christ as your Savior. But more likely, we are all in here. We, we know somebody who needs the Lord. Let's pray for those this morning. We may know of a ministry in, in this church that is, that is essential and that needs more prayer, more workers. Let's pray for that ministry today. We all know that the, the mission of the church is to take the gospel to our community. Let's pray for that today. And we know that we live in a culture that desperately needs the gospel. Let's pray for that today. As the church of God, united in prayer, would you pray for those things this morning? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to pray together.